thank you very much for inviting me and I, I do have to start by saying I have had a note a text from you saying a vote is imminent so um, if I have to disappear part way through I will try and come back the rest of the time um, okay so COVID-19 has sent shockwaves through higher education sector in the immediate aftermath of the lockdown universities were faced with the challenge of moving their courses online helping students to access those courses, confusion over accommodation, hardship funds, exams, awarding degrees, and a seemingly endless barrage of problems, all requiring prompt and robust solutions. During the first months of the crisis, the DfE chose to sit on its hands. When called to act in support of universities, it deferred to their independent status, generic business support, or to the role of the Office for Students, and left the sector to its own devices. Fortunately, higher education is populated with de dedicated, adaptable and resourceful people. And I would like to commend you like all with coping with the pandemic as well as you did. Then the financial implications for the future started to roll in. The Institute for Financial Studies gave its central estimate of the total long run sector losses at 11 billion, more than a quarter of the usual income in one year. Universities are unlikely to be able to claw back a large portion of these losses through cost savings unless they make significant numbers of staff redundant. In the IFS central scenario, they estimate that cost savings could reduce overall fill by only 600 million or around 6% without redundancies. The London Economics paper on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on universities' finances predicted a total of 60,000 jobs could be lost in the sector. If the ISS study predicted 13 universities, educating around 5% of students would end up with negative reserves and so may not be viable in the long run without a government bailout or debt restructuring. In some regions, our universities are one of the only few graduate employers and any job loss would have a negative impact on the local economy in which a university resides. Of the 60,000 job losses predicted by the London Economic Paper, 30,000 were in the local community and the total amount of lost spending in, in the local economies was a staggering 6.1 billion. This government must understand that they cannot level up by shutting down. The government's response to the looming university financial crisis has been to launch an attack on the sector, accusing it of offering low value degrees, astonishingly implying that if you don't come from a family where your parents have gone to university, you could somehow be tricked into attending university. There is a real opportunity for true social mobility and revolutionary change in the makeup of universities if the universities all deliver on their five-year widening opportunities and access plans. The government should be doubling down on this commitment rather than throwing widening participation targets under the bus, by the university minister telling the Education Select Committee, quote, it doesn't matter about looking at which groups don't go to university. Having rejected proposals for both a sector-wide guarantee and then targeted bailouts, the government has now announced its higher education restructuring regime, which, in its opening remarks by Gavin Williamson, declares it is not a guarantee that no organisation will fail. Labour cannot countenance the loss of a single university, because we cannot countenance the equal loss of opportunity. At a time when the country is facing the possibility of the deepest recession in its history, when unemployment is set to soar and when training and reskilling will be more needed than ever, the government's position is beyond rational comprehension. The higher education restructuring regime also threatens the total breadth of position, provision the institution provides in its area. Wholesale course cuts could create regional cold spots, leaving a geographical area without adequate provision. Local provision is vital for so-called commuter students, who are predominantly from the most disadvantaged groups, part-time, low-income families, mature, and black, Asian and minority ethnic students. Instead of the government supporting lifelong learning, we could instead see a reduction of opportunity and aspiration at the local level for those who need it the most, at the worst possible time. Any university forced into accessing a loan through higher education restructuring regime must consider, amongst other things, Ending, quote, duplic uh, <coughs> duplication of courses, whether level four or five courses may be more appropriate, and whether local FE institutions might be better placed to offer them. These considerations must be placed into context and recognise the economic reality facing further education. It cannot be overstated that further education has been defunded to the tune of 1.4 billion a year in real terms compared to 2010 levels. This government have only offered a £300 million sticking plaster. There is very limited capacity to relocate students to local FE. In fact, if what we're hearing is right, 
in the face of the current crisis, half of FE colleges are planning on making redundancies. And there goes my bell. I'll try and finish a little bit. Gavin Williamson's talk of rebalancing funding between FE and HE makes it sound as if resources have been pulled from FE into HE. This is not the case. It was a Conservative Party decision to remove the student number caps, create a market-led university system, only offer loans and funding for degrees and cut funding to FE and adult education. The funding via loans followed the market the government created. The Labour Party's position is that everyone, everywhere, has the right to education and training that they need. What people need is high quality careers advice and guidance combined with genuine choice. That means the course that they want must be affordable and locally available, whatever it is and whoever is providing it. For this to happen, both further education and adult education must be properly funded. We need a post-18 landscape that includes even more degree apprenticeships, part-time degrees, modular courses, and that is accompanied by levels of maintenance funding that make them a realistic proposition. To enable real choice for everyone, the government should be focused on identifying the barriers to learning and then breaking them down, not establishing more. We cannot ever see a situation again where education is viewed as a privilege for the few and not a right for all. We all have a right to learn and having an educated population not only helps us individually, but as a country too. No country's economy has grown on the back of reducing access to higher education. It matters which groups in society get access to university. It is true that the biggest barrier preventing those born into disadvantage improving their situation is being born into disadvantage itself. Our universities have been asked to solve the problems of social mobility at the same time as child poverty is growing and the attainment gap is widening. If the government is serious about social mobility, then I suggest that they must tackle this problem head on. Our higher education system is not perfect and there is always more the sector to do, can do. For example, to tackle the BME attainment gap, support for disadvantaged students during university, the suitability of some courses, and how welcoming institutions are to mature and part-time students, amongst other things. But I recognise the progress already made on Vice-Chancellor pay and awarding grades, and I would encourage the sector not to leave itself vulnerable to lazy attacks. The development of blended learning has been an abject lesson in the sector's responsiveness and willingness to evolve, and this could be applied to improving the offer for those with special educational needs and disabilities, for example, to widen opportunities even further. Labour believe that universities have a vital community and developmental role to play in helping the country to build back better. Many are already actively engaged in that task. I read with great interest the Civic University Commission report and its proposals that all universities develop a clear strategy in cooperation with local partners that is rooted in a robust and shared analysis of local needs and opportunities. And I'm very supportive of these suggestions. The government should be doing everything in its power to support and assist our universities. The vision Labour are keen to foster is that of universities as the powerhouse of local regeneration and of social mobility. We now have a, a quick flashback to Emma, who's got four minutes with us before she has to dash again. So Emma, could I ask you if you, if you would to please share some, some concluding comments because you, you had to run off once the bell was ringing. So, um, although as a school teacher, that probably <laughs> is a familiar kind of... It is that old school teachers know you have to train your bladder to coincide whenever a bell goes. Um, so, sorry, I'm so sorry I missed everyone's uh, contributions and hopefully I'll be able to catch up on the recording. I think the, the final part of the contribution I wanted to make is really around this commitment to universities and recognising their importance, both in what they do for people as an individual, but what they do for society more widely. And I think sometimes we've lost, well, not us, but the country has lost that sense of the importance of universities as public bodies and the contribution that they bring to not just in terms of economic sense but in terms of cultural sense and and i'm concerned with the sort of as i mentioned earlier the lazy attacks that are being leveled at universities and and during this incredibly difficult time and one of the fears i have at the moment is we're going to see the same pace of change in the higher education sector that we saw in the school sector between 2010 and 2015. Um, so I'm sorry I'd missed everyone else's contributions because I wanted to use my final comments to actually make reference to the points that um, other people have made. So in my last two minutes, if there is anything 
super quick that anyone would like me to mention but because I've missed it then uh, then I'm more than happy to do that before I disappear um, again. Could I abuse the position of chair Emma to ask if firstly whether we whether you might allow us the opportunity to come and talk to you a little bit more about what's going on at our universities and to you know champion our case but also um, if 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 you could provide more of a parliamentary profile as we hope Dr Williams will do for the the convention statement and you know help us to make this virtual lobby into a real lobby and and guide us in how that might how we might encourage some of your colleagues especially those who are in uh, seats where universities have a you know a huge impact to think more carefully about what they're doing and are there things that we can do that we, are you able to offer some suggestions on that yeah absolutely um in, in terms of the sort of labor party response and my, my response in that area i'm so we're launching sort of a bit of a um, well, i won't say too much about it because it's all been launched on friday but a bit of a response and, and talking more widely about where labor see and what and the importance of higher education um in terms of, of offering you more of a platform in, in parliament more than happy to um, it's a shame we haven't been able to do it physically and hopefully in the future we could hold a physical event in Parliament. Um, but some of the other things of course that you can do as a group is there are various cross-party groups set up in Parliament. There's the all-party parliamentary group for um, universities, there's an all-party parliamentary group for international students and a all-party parliamentary group for students as well. So there are a number of different um, vehicles in which you could make your voice uh, voice heard. And speaking as a constituency MP, the, the reason I'm most likely to attend an event is because people living in my constituency have asked me to. Um, and so I would, I would sort of obviously urge people to contact their member of parliament and ask them to attend that local event. And there's various uh, consultations going on from all these different all party parliamentary groups that um, we, I would urge you to sort of all get involved in. Because as I say, I think the pace of change is going to pick up. I think the narrative coming out from the government is, is concerning. Um, and I think the sector needs to be, um, needs to try and be as united and as strong as possible in countering, um, in countering some of this and standing up for what you all do and the difference that you all make to uh, not just individuals, but the community and society as a whole. As I said earlier on, no, com no country improves its economy and social cohesion by restricting access to higher university. And, um, and I certainly hope I, hope I sort of reassured you that I will try and be a champion for the sector as much as possible because I know of the opportunities that it brings and how life changing it can be. Thank you, Emma. Um, I'm very grateful that you're here and um, thanks for your contributions.